thanks again, Leo, for like agreeing to come back on and, and talk about. I think the the main focus that we, we talked about last week for this week was uh, how to break through um, the, the programming of people who haven't realised the true nature of of reality that they're experiencing. So, so I get, so again, like thanks so much for agreeing to come back on and. Um, it'd be good if you could just talk through some of the images and the words that you used in in your bar to try to to break through that programming. Absolutely, and uh, thank you for having me back. I enjoyed our last chat. It was obvious we could have gone on for quite a bit further. <clears throat> so, unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to put together a presentation. Although I'm happy to do that, and we can revisit it at a later date, showing like the types of questionnaires and maybe some stills, some photos from the bars. I think that might. Uh, uh, help your audience kind of see what, what I was trying to do there. Uh, I would like to pull out a bit more because this is what we're going to talk on, on on this hour, that I never really um, finished the model. Uh, I, I knew that I needed some help with some collaborators to come in there, some other behavioral scientists to really tweak it, and also some statisticians. Um, that, that's not my strong point. And then one other uh, element that I lacked is I don't have very many computer skills. And I knew that yeah. better videos, both copying what we were doing so that others might be able to replicate it, but also to try and bring people to that wake up moment. So I, I actually have far more experience of one on one interviews than I do in group dynamics. And that's really where I, I wanted to go. I wanted to sort of rather than just me talking to one person or anyone talking to one person, how can we create a group that, that eases the cognitive load of the individual? Because uh, the, the person that you're trying to sort of wake up, so, uh, for want of a better word, um, it's definitely easier if it's done in a group setting. And as we touched on with the Ash Conformity Test, if you've got other people in there mm -hmm. that are all, all already showing them the way out. Um, and one thing I never really made fully clear either in our last chat is, although I had a lot of success on the night in getting people to kind of like, yeah, you're right, the mask is nonsense, I would see them walking around town the next day with the mask yeah. right back on. Well, I'm not saying that this works as a complete deprogram, you're no longer an NPC. No, not that no. I think people are NPCs, but to, to, um, to, it, to be fair, Leo, you actually did you actually did mention that last week, to be to be fair to you. So and I, okay, and I know well, what I think... you go on. Sorry, I know I know what you're saying as well about the computer skills, and you know that could be something that somebody watching this video who does have those computer skills, they could hopefully take some of these ideas and build on them and do some of this work themselves. Because the more of us who are doing this, the better. It's it's not going to work if it's just me and Leo trying to do it. I think. If it's going to work, more and more of us actually have to start doing some of this work our ourselves rather than just watching and listening. Absolutely. Sorry, Leo. No, no, absolutely. I think you made a very valid point. If there is anyone in your audience that is interested, they can reach out to you, uh, me through you or, or me directly, and I'd be very happy to collaborate. Um, I think also, obviously, as you know, I'm based in Borneo. And as a foreigner, it's a bit harder to cross that cultural void. I really wish more than anything that I'd been in England during the lockdowns where I'm from, because then I, I could replicate it uh, or, or done what I was trying here in the UK, where I do think there was a lot more resistance than in a lot of other countries. Asia was very flat in terms of resisting. Um, and I think you could have got the, that volunteer element. You might have had somebody that was, you know, paying attention and said, okay, you can use my pub or you can use my hall or venue and then kind of run this gamification. Because I know that you've got to have people incentivized to look rather than de-incentivized to look. And because of the ego, the cognitive pain in questioning things that we're clinging to is immense. So so you've yeah. got to motivate them to, to look. Leo, um, but for, forgive me, right? I, I'm, I'm a complete novice when it comes to I, I, I know about behavioral economics, but you know, like the, the deeper psychology, I'm, I'm a bit clueless on. So, could you just sort of like briefly like flesh out that idea about ego and 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 how that yeah, stops yeah. people from? On a simplistic level, we and all animals' life uh, moves away from aversive stimuli, pain, and moves towards pleasurable uh, stimuli. If, let's say, you realize you've been mugged off royally over the last four years and perhaps done things to your own body or to your own children, um, you know, perhaps forcing them to, to you know, uh, obstruct their breathing, 
that's going to really hurt to, to come to that realization. It's like, whoa, did I just abuse my child? Did I fall out with someone and call them an idiot when all they were showing me was compassion and trying to warn me? Um, the ego, particularly in males, although in females too, is very protective of its own self-image. And, and a lot of this happens on a subconscious level. It's not popping up into you know our prefrontal cortex and we're not having deep thoughts about it. There is an emotional aversion to causing the ego pain. It wants to maintain its uh, uh, worldview, which is that hands, face, space, everything's okay, if, if one's already bought into that. And of course, the converse is true to those that were dissenters like us. It would be very hard for me to admit that I got it wrong entirely over the last four years, though maybe that is, it, it is possible. Maybe there was a deadly, uh, you know, thing, a, invisible monster possessing people. Um, so it's just that ego tries to protect itself and tries to protect our worldview. And I think the other thing that's uh, important is that when we receive stimuli or thoughts or a human interaction, often we have an emotive response to it first. I don't know if you've gone very much into predictive programming or nudge units, that they're hitting that that sort of uh, framing, these heuristic principles, so that we'll have a feeling like that feels, um, Leo's trying to tell me to take something off my face, that feels wrong, I don't want to be like an idiot. And then what the, the prefrontal cortex or the, the cognition does is it uses our intellectual thought to reinforce the emotion but the emotion is not particularly thinking. It's just a, a, a largely a conditioned response um, based on heuristics, like, well, everyone else is doing it. The government wouldn't lie to us. All the, not everyone can't be wrong. Someone would have said something. So all, all of that stuff frames are, Leo's a nut job. Uh, let's not li hear what he has to say. Um, well, do you, do, and do then, you think those, Leo, do you think those frames are often introduced by, by the government? Is that, is that what you're saying? You know, those like, kind of like ready-made um, excuses or not um, lines of thought, they're sort of pre-programmed yeah. and that's where the predictive programming comes in. So so when it happens, right. people have already got... I always think about that line in the first Terminator film where Arnie's fixing his eye in the bathroom and uh, some guy comes up, the hotel owner, and like there's a terrible smell in there and, you know, in you can see Arnie's kind of like computer brain. It's got these various options, and he selects, you know, QR or whatever it is. And yeah, that, for me, that's almost like an NPC thing because, you know, oh, you're just an anti-vaxxer. Oh, that's just a conspiracy theory. And these these lines that that people come out with are definitely pre-programmed, and they're not their own. I absolutely agree. I mean, in that scene, you could argue that the machine is actually choosing its response. I think it's more visceral, more emotive. It's like, oh, then you must believe the world is flat. It's just a throwback. I think it, it sparks, uh, uh, they're not given a list of options to choose from. There is one that just feels right, so it gushes yeah. forth. Um, yeah. Uh, but ab absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, that they're pre-programmed. As to how deeply some of these things are pre-programmed, that's what perhaps alarms me the most about what, what this experience what we're having in this realm, because I think it starts at school and through children's TV programs right. and yeah. both predictive and concurrent programming that's just going on c continuously, leaving us with a mass mediated mind that the TV is now the arbiter of truth or that the, uh, the iPhone is the arbiter of truth, not your own reason or the elders in your own community or, or anything like that. I mean, uh, um, trans rights to human rights would be one of those programmed response. Uh, you hear it enough that if the emotion uh, triggers, that then you're like, well, I don't think you or I would throw it out. Okay, Lee, I'm going to throw this one in because um, I think, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm remembering this right or not, but you you were often deemed to be a troublemaker at school. And, you know, for, for me, I school wasn't the happiest time of my life particularly lower down the school because again i had the same sort of problems like you i didn't accept any uh bs from them if, if something didn't make sense I, I wouldn't do it or i would say this doesn't make sense where i'm going with this is that do you think that I, i'm sure that this, this stuff doesn't work on me and I, it, it it's, it doesn't work on you. So well, why is that? Have you have any ideas about why why some of us just seem to be completely immune to to the to the, the or to a lesser extent <clears throat> immune? 
Well, in 2020, I joined a lot of those medical freedom groups, resistance groups, and try, tried to find organized, not necessarily academics, but thinking people that had some credibility to them. Um, <clears throat> and I interviewed so many people uh, uh, to join some of these organizations. I spoke to an awful lot of hypnotists. And um, I've always been on the fence as to whether or not hypnotism is even real or not. I, I've been yeah. on stage hypnotized about five or six times and had nothing, zero effect whatsoever. <laughs> and it's like, is it real? You know? Um, uh, and one guy I spoke to, though, an American hypnotist, quite, d- done some TED Talks, not that that means anything in, in post-2020 world, but um, seemed like a sensible chap. And he said he's one of the best in his game, but he, he can only get about 10% of the audience. He explained a lot of stuff. We went through the heuristics. But then I asked him a question. That if he'd had access to the child, uh, everyone's education system for the last you know, three generations, control of the television, how many people did he think he could get? He's like 99% straight away because it's about uh, i'm saying dropping these anchoring framing you know availability heuristic references but if you can control that mental mind space which i believe the television does or or more and more it's not television it's all media it's these digital devices you probably are creating an environment where only a very small number of people could push back why do we push back why did i push back when i was so young and perhaps not my siblings who are of very similar levels of intelligence. That is very hard to say. Um, with yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, there might be a spiritual answer to it. I, I don't have it. Yeah. Um, Fair enough. Maybe. Fair enough, Leo. So, so um, you know, because time's sort of limited because I'm on this 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 free version of Zoom. Do, yeah. do you just want to sort of talk through? Uh, some of the exercises that you used and um, because I think actually in some ways that actually that might work very well to just you know painting a picture with words can actually be, be, be pretty effective absolutely well I, I will focus on the moon landings not because I'm just obsessed on that but it is quite it the footage is dated terribly a lot of people are open to saying oh yeah that there are a lot of questions here, you know. Um, so having access to that raw footage and the footage of some of the blooper reel from the ISS. So what, one way that I would frame the question is I would do easy entry questions. Who's the first man on the moon? Who's the second man on the moon? So people are buying in. They're like, I know this one. I've got it. And then I would show videos, uh, either in one-on-one interviews or, or, or in the group uh, uh, settings. Um and then uh, probably, how to explain it simplest? The easiest way, as I say, you've got to pique their interest. They've got to want to know the answer. So then you can frame something as one of these videos was done by conspiracy theorists and is fake and involves a green screen. Can you tell which one? Then you play the video and then you say, well, when it's in a group setting, I would say to the audience, anyone want it replay? Take as long as you need. Um, Where I really would have liked to have taken it is that I could have had an interactive thing on people's phones that, you know, log into like the quiz and then uh, predetermine stuff. I never got to that level. But then you pick their interest and they're like, yeah, one of these is using a green screen. And they look and then they're looking like, it's this one. And then before giving them the answer, just yes or no, you win the prize. I tried introducing what's your confidence interval. Can you show me where you think that this is a green screen? Or in the the other video I used to use a lot is the one where uh, the, the astronaut drops a screw. And you see him just look and it goes ding and it, it just drops straight down. And, and, and <laughs> people can pick that up. If you just say, look, this proves there's no gravity on the International Space Station or this proves it's a green screen, you, they're, they're going to try and resist you. When you pick yeah. their curiosity and you show them two th- two pieces of footage, both from NASA, one that passes the sniff test, one that's obviously wrong, you then get them to wear it. I, um, you can further, this is on the one-on-one interview, you can give people tokens or one ringgit notes, like one pound notes. And he's like, well, bet bet with your confidence. How confident are you that you've got the fake one? Uh, and, and then I would frame it on that. Uh, NASA and then lowercase NASA is how I had it in the things. Lowercase NASA is the conspiracy theorist. Uh, capital case is, is the government, you know, space agency. And then it's like, right, which video do you think was made by NASA? Or which video do you think was not made by NASA? And then they would pitch in with high confidence saying, no, no, I saw him drop the screw. Or I saw where the green screen went yeah. bad. Or, and the, the other one also is the harnesses. There's a lot of videos out there. These are from NASA's website of uh, ast- astronauts clearly wearing harnesses. It's like clown world stuff. There's even one yeah. that, that they broadstream where a gorilla jump, uh, a man in a gorilla suit jumps out of the, the box. 
And when you get people to, to frame it, it's like, is this real? Which one's the professional space agency? Which one's, you know, people trying to make you uh, uh, be fooled like an idiot? Then they're there and you reveal and you're like, actually, that one's from NASA. Um, with uh, what I, I found that worked better than saying they're both from NASA. Yeah. No, no. Great. Right. So that worked very well. And then another one, I guess, on the psychology behind it. Um, this might make me sound like a terrible person, but I'm, I, I, I don't really have a filter. <laughs> so I at first tried to use my credibility, you know, working with animals, my knowledge, my government connections, and everyone just laughed at me or thought I was mad or, or tried to arrest me in extreme cases. Um, so then I realized what was going on. I'd, I'd already been talking to a couple of other behavioral scientists uh, through one of the, the medical organizations I work with, Pandata. And... Um, we, we, we've got it. It's like, okay, the wall's up. We, we've got to connect to people emotionally. So I joined a whole bunch of dating apps. Um, I'm single, but I wasn't looking for love or anything like that. <laughs> and I, I must stress, I wasn't trying to be too manipulatory and I wasn't trying to catfish people for money or affections. All I wanted to do was warn people about certain imminent medical choices that were coming up a few months uh, down the road. Yeah. Yeah. And it's there that I had, as I suspected I would, by far the greatest success. Um, I went on as myself because I didn't want to be fraudulent. I think it would have worked much better if I'd have got, not bot accounts, but uh, photographs of very attractive men and very attractive females and run them as sock puppet accounts because people are drawn to uh, aesthetically attractive things. But I didn't yeah. want to be too, I, I wanted to really be myself. And I was, one, targeting uh, people that worked in the medical profession and in the teaching profession, wanting to just have a conversation and, and get feedback. So, not infiltrate, but you know, I, I, yeah. I was I was matching with people significantly older than me. Then there was no chance of any romantic from from my side. But I would be polite, and then it, it, it involved a huge amount of texting, so, um, which I hate using phones. And most of these apps are only on your phone. But um, I, I kind of worked out you have to have a positive, engaging, non conspiratorial uh, intro conversation of about five questions. Hi, how are you? Doesn't count, but like question and answer yeah. backwards and and then i would express that oh int i'm very interested to meet you blah 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 um by the way i just saw this video i have no idea what to make of it a friend sent it to me tell me what you think and then i would send them videos that, that other resisting people had put out but yeah. not too sure. um and then because they're already I, i'm i'm assuming here that these people that were older than me would look at me as a westerner that is a positive card uh, I, I used to own quite a lot of businesses. I was on TV a lot. So pumping up my status perhaps a little bit. Yeah. It's a bit cringeworthy. But I think these people were genuinely invested in exploring a relationship with me. It's not the hookup. Like Tinder's not the hookup app over yeah, here. Yeah. Very different. They, they use it as a dating app or whatnot. Or, um, so there I have by far the most success. I think I convinced thousands of people not to uh, uh, take certain medical choice or Let help them make choices. Leo. And... Sorry, just something like really, really important from my perspective, because I, I would imagine when you initially send them that video, the, the people that I know, um, you know, this wouldn't be in the context of dating, but maybe old friends that I had, people I've played sport with and whatever. For me, what I would get back from them is, oh, that's just a conspiracy theory. I would get that just like just like that, you know. So what type of I know you said you'd need to pitch it at a, at a certain level, but how low would you actually go? Have you got any examples of how how mild it would have to be to get them to think? I sent a lot of philosophy stuff because I'm quite interested in philosophy, and I think that was probably way too highbrow for, for the Malaysian audience. I wouldn't go on anything that was inflaming at all. I would pick measured speakers um, that, that and, and maybe that was wrong. Maybe I should have gone for TikTok videos rather than a half-hour uh, presentation or, or, or an interview, you know, perhaps like one of yours. I'm, I'm, your, yours are quite easily accessible from the ones yeah. that I've seen. They, what do you think, you know, with the, uh, about it? And then try and draw a conversation from them rather than get anything polarizing. And one of the problems you might have with some of your friends is I'm guessing if you're like me, you probably already made your position quite clear quite early on. So yeah. when they come to me, they're already putting their defences up there. Now, I, yeah. I'm just going to try and convince me that, you know, there isn't a uh, certain thing uh, going on in the world. Um, they have to want to listen to you. And that's the point of the emotive hook. Because it was on a dating agency, 
People have put up with all sorts of stuff. I guess I would. If I met a really, I mean, maybe not, but if I met a stunningly pretty girl and they were wearing a mask, would the first thing I do say like, hey, Muppet, take that off, what are you doing? You know, probably, you might Pro- not. Probably you know. I would. I might. Well, that's I one might of our weaknesses, well. you know, that's, I, I, like you just said a minute ago, I don't I don't have an off switch either. I just Yeah. And um, I don't I really give too many um um thingamajigs about what, what people think of think of me. I think that's I'm I, I probably guess that's part of your makeup too. Would you, yeah, you know, I'm not being I'm not overly I don't derive my self identity from what other people tell me about myself. I think what certainly perhaps amplified that in me is that I work with very big, dangerous animals. You could spin them a yarn and sing them a song, and they don't care. But how yeah. you physically present yourself makes a massive difference. You know, um, I have occasionally, I think, bluffed my way out of a fight with an adult orangutan. It's like, <laughs> I, I think Leo might actually fight back without realizing they could just tear me apart to, to in seconds. So, yeah. Um, yeah it, it, and again, just to restress for anyone that's listening, if they want to try and start thinking about or exploring their own options for this, they the the the, the, the mark, if you like, has to be invested in um, pleasing you to a certain degree, appearing to be appealing to you. That on lots of ways, our oh, yeah. friends and family, because they know us so well, aren't. When there's a slight romantic sort of uh, interest there, or a cash prize interest, like you have to incentivize them yeah. to push through that cognitive dissonance uh, maybe it's a uh, cognitive dissonance is too big a word but that um, aversion that in, in that framing aversion to it um because it happens so quickly even amongst your friends even to my sister she would get angry straight away it's like i just asked yeah. you to watch things like am conspiracy theorists you've gone mad yeah um so the the brain isn't really thinking it through you know just no. to my sister They've already they've already made their not so much their mind up they've made their heart up and then the mind does all the work of justifying why the the heart had that response. Because an, another thing that I hear a lot and I'm I'm not um, I'm not I'm not a hundred percent with this but I hear from quite a few people that oh the reason for this conformity it's all to do with uh, uh, evolution let's let's say uh, in that human beings. Um, realize that if they become outsiders to the group their chances of survival diminishes so therefore there's been strong natural selection towards people who are inclined towards conformity would would you go with that prior to 2020 i always would but prior to 2020 i would have described myself as a monkey um not having a uh, soul so i think the the depth of fraud in the stories that we're interacting with, you know, as society uh, as being real, and the depths of fraud in both medicine and science, it's actually too broad for a lot of people to really start reinventing this stuff. Um, we're told a lot of simple stories. You, you know, we talked about programmed responses. An yeah. awful lot of slightly to well-educated people like us would give that example. Oh, we do this for fear of being exiled from the group back in our hunter gatherer days, just like monkeys do. Yeah, is yeah, that yeah. actually? I don't know. I've been fairly successful in my life, and I've always got it on my own. Yeah, that's what I would say too. That's what I would say too. I think people can find it quite interesting, or and I just enjoy being like that anyway. Um, but one, one, just a, a random idea here. Um, uh, do you remember, let's call it the Big Nine event, you know, uh, the aeroplanes and whatever. Um, wh- one thing that I've tried, uh, and I think it's indisputable, really, um, is, you know, the pictures of the, the Pentagon building with the yeah. hole in it. And the, the line is that, you know, officially like um, a civil airliner made the damage, made the hole. Well, I'll say to people, I've tried this with 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 one guy who I raised, and I, I I suspect he's probably changed his position on it now. Um, but I, I've asked a simple question: Does this look? Does this damage look like it's been done by a civil airliner? Now, again, for me, because I'm kind of a bit blunt and I can also be a bit piss takey and aggressive, is I said to and do mockery, you know, so like. Oh, you can obviously you can see the the um, the debris from the jet engine and the tail fins over there. When obviously, you know, the damage doesn't look like that at all, and there's no plane debris. Um, 
I have used that, and I think maybe in the long run, you might get resistance initially, but maybe hopefully in the long run, the weight of evidence might force people or encourage people to maybe re reconsider their initial position. I, yeah. I don't know. I, I think a mistake that a lot of people make is they send friends and family, or I mean, we're going back now a couple of years, uh, a, a video link, and they expect that they're going to read it. Um, that's a problem. Uh, definitely it's better yeah. to do things face-to-face -face interactions and if you see emotion don't match that emotion uh, yeah. because then people just entrench in their positions i do think and I, I never experimented with this in the quizzes but i do think there is a place for mockery uh, certainly of, of anyone in authority um certainly anyone wearing a uniform um I, I freely mock them to their faces i think they very much deserve it it helps bring them yeah. down um, yeah. but i think it could be a role for mockery not so much our friends and family but 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 you know the people around us but it would have to be used wisely. And I'll give a quick example. I have a lot of random general knowledge. It's, uh, it's changed a lot the last four years, but I'm very good at retaining information. So I would do very well in quizzes, pub quizzes, in fact. Years ago, I went to a pub quiz in Ipswich, and I'd had a couple of beers, but I was doing very well against a table of old old boys practically smoking pipes with uh, tweed patches. The last question was, uh, they, they pulled it, it was a quiz machine, they pulled it out. Subject, zoology. I'm like, I've won. <laughs> I'm totally there. <laughs> and the question was, how many deadly spiders are there in the world? And I thought about it. I was like, oh, I didn't know there were any deadly spiders. But my framing was wrong because they said how many. I was like, oh, no, Brazilian jumping spider, funnel web, red back, three. And then the guy looked at me and was like, oh, two. And the answer was zero. And I was yeah. so angry that I was wrong and I missed out on like 50 pounds of beer. I, I went home. And for about five hours, I was studying like, I'm going to prove that there's a deadly spider. And then at the end, I had to concede, like, there's no such thing as a deadly spider. You know, people might die of anaphylaxis, but, but the spiders aren't deadly. So some people will go away because they're like, I've got a point to prove. Um, but most people, when they're in that mode, like when my research, uh, for it probably was about four hours, um, the, I wanted to prove that there was a deadly spider. My, my focus was yeah. all wrong. And you'll have that a lot with your friends and you have to be a bit careful with the mocking. You even have to be a bit careful with the, the compassion. I had many people earlier on uh, saying, oh, you sanctimonious, get, you're acting like you're better than us or you're some spiritually awake yeah. guru. And I'm like, I'm not, just, you know, peace and love. Um, yeah, so well, sorry, well, I was babbling a bit. No, no, well, no, 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 no. Um, you know, from my position, it was like my over overriding sort of feeling at the time was just one of... An, just immense frustration. Like, why can't these people see this? It is so obvious. Um, that's how, the, and that's where the frustration built up in me. And then it's just one of my own personal weaknesses. I will then go in too hard, and I'll use mockery. I'll take the piss, or I'll I'll basically black pill them. I'll say to them, "Look, this is this is the direction of travel. This is what's going to happen, or this is what they're going to try to do." Bam, 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 bam. And my feeling at the time was, um, hopefully these these people will actually look back at what I said two or three years ago when I said this, this and you know they'll be ticking them off. Well, he said this, this, and that might help to break through their programming as well. That actually I have been lied to. Nigel said that X, Y, and Z were going to happen, and they have happened. So therefore, maybe I should listen to Nigel a little bit more and and, and a little bit less to BBC Radio Four today. Yeah, I mean, I do believe in sowing the seeds. In fact, uh, as a teacher, you might like this. I, I run a volunteer program where people pay to work at the volunteer centre. And when we first reopened, the first thing I would talk to them about would be uh, uh, the, the last four years. So they've come on holiday. They, they want to hear about orangutan. And then they've got some guy going, let me show you everything that, that I found. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And had a very negative impact on their experience. So I didn't want to destroy people's holiday. So after a couple of months, I was like, okay. And then I left it till the end of the experience. So I would talk to them about orangutan, you know, uh, talk to them about the, the charity and the work that we do. Generally, people have a very good time on our projects. Uh, so at the end, they're like, wow, this has all been amazing. And then yeah. I would start dropping uh, uh, bits in. But uh, Brilliant. I did welcome him where I was feeling the, the, the group out. Like if I find someone that's, you know, paying attention, then I'll go straight into it. And... The, these two young ladies, uh, one of them was a bit aghast at what I was saying. And one was kind of like, 
oh, you remind me of a teacher that I had at school. It's always stayed with me what he said about make up your own mind. Your thoughts and your opinions aren't necessarily your own, especially yeah. when you feel them most keenly. So, yeah, but with the mocking, it's difficult. Depends on the person. It's probably best to avoid mocking. I, I, I agree, Leo, and it's something that's it's a fault that I have um, and I need to work, and I will work on it. I am working on it. Right, so we've got 10 minutes left. And another idea I'm going to float past you is um, that's a weakness of this sort of approach of, of, um, of like our own version of predictive programming, telling people in advance what the, what the, the agenda is at the World Economic Forum or, or whatever. And that is, I think that um, they... The powers that should be created, um, false agent agents who are spreading misinformation, and I think one of the, the the key things that they did was to try to get. So I don't like this phrase, so I'm going to take the piss out of it. So-called truthers um, to um, share just ridiculous stuff about I don't know nanotech inside, um, you know, you know what and. Just stuff that was just completely do lally wacko stuff, because then they could come back in and say, "Well, look, look at these these silly conspiracy theorists." Absolutely. So I call it truth for trick bait uh, instead of clickbait trick bait. Um, <clears throat> I spent in the last four years, I spent half my time talking to professional academics and scientists, and half of my time exploring the world of conspiracy theories. I've gone in immensely deep uh, uh, into these things. And there's some shocking stuff out there that appears to be true. Um, there's also a lot of nonsense. What I'm absolutely convinced of is that the mainstream media, whatever writes the mainstream media, is absolutely behind the uh, conspiracy. It's generating the conspiracy theories. It's putting this stuff out there. It's trying to fool people. And as you rightly say, there's a lot of nonsense. One problem I've had when I, I try to talk to people and make them think for themselves is you destroy a certain narrative. And they're like, well, tell me, tell me what is happening then. It's like, no, no, you need yeah. to work it out for yourself. That's humans love to be told what to do. So the flock to the brands and the Rogans and like, oh, now I don't have to think for myself. Whereas my message is, no, you've got to put your own work in. So yeah. when I heard of nanobots in blood and in, in the, the uh, injectables, I went and got trays of injectables, started doing experiments on them, mixed them with my own blood, not in my body, mixed them with uh, friends and colleagues' bloods. Uh, and I was not finding any of the results yeah. that all of this I mean, my, my clinic's very small, uh, but people have to put their own work in. That's why we're in such a mess. Outsourcing Correct. our thinking to homes and to leaders. Um, Correct. That's the... And I, I guess I've not done those experiments, so I'm I'm completely open-minded about what was actually in those glass vials. And obviously, I don't... I think there's probably quite a high likelihood that what was in the vials varied between batches, but I don't have any fixed ideas about that because I can't objectively check myself. These days, I only check what I can perceive with my own senses directly. That's 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 my feeling. I, I tested thousands of people to see if they were magnetic. I went into that believing that no one would be magnetic. I found two people who were magnetic. I, two out of thousands is not everyone. But that yeah. was the last thing we expected. The last but was that thing was that like, was that was that due to the the stuff that was in the vials, or was could that have been? I don't know. So the, were they always the, magnetic? No, no, no. Uh, it happened immediately afterwards and faded oh, right. after a couple. Of months. I can put that oh. down to some kind of contaminant. You know, certainly. Yeah. Uh, it, most, nothing yeah, yeah. whatsoever. Um, yeah. But I expected that that would not be the case. I expected that nobody would be magnetic. Yeah. So, but and two out of thousands isn't proof. But it is important to put your own work in, and not enough people do this. Leo, I because you're because you're a, a, a you know a proper proper scientist. You know you, you and you're of a certain age like me, where you were probably taught about the scientific method. You know, I, I did the field A level biology, and that was that was I, that the scientific method was really kind of like drummed into me. Then you know, studying economics, I learned all about Karl Popper, falsification, verification. So that's been hardwired into me about keeping an open mind, and and you can never you can never prove something to be categorically true. All you can do is disprove a theory. But yeah, you know, if we've got five, we've got five minutes left. I, 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 again, I'm not sure whether you've got answers to this one because it's a tricky, tricky question. But how 
do you believe that there are any there are any telltale signs and, and symptoms of somebody who is a bad actor, a so-called controlled opposition? Tons. Um it's very hard to fake authenticity. Um the uh it, so if something looks performative, it, it probably is. Um the cross promotion, a friend of mine calls it bros with shows. Uh I call it a circle jerk of sophists. If let's say someone but for me at this stage. If someone appears on Joe Rogan and they're not asking some very hard questions of Joe Rogan, they can just write them off straight away. If they're doing the rounds and appearing, you know, with certain other people, um, if they're interviewed by Piers Morgan, they're a joke. Anyone that's interviewing anyone that's been uh, interviewed by Piers Morgan is probably a joke. If they're on television, that's a big one. You know, um, yeah. if you know their name, that's a big one. There's a reason yeah. why we know all of these names. And a friend of mine, uh, a writer called Miri, um, constantly gets accused of calling everyone uh, shields or controlled or stuff like that. And her rebuttal is like, no, no, the number of people that are, the names that household names that we know are a tiny, tiny percentage of humanity. So she trusts most people. She just doesn't trust the ones that are appearing yeah. on the news on TV. Good, uh, excellent point. Excellent point. Yeah. I think my, my my on my list would be whether they're being pushed by by the the gulag tube um, algorithm. Yeah. Um, for me, also, these, sorry, this, Leo. This this wasn't a difficult um, realization to to reach for those of us that held morals. It wasn't even about complicated science or rabbit holes of conspiracy theories. It's like this is yeah. wrong. You know, well, uh, just on, on this level. So. I'm all for people that have changed their stance and changed their mind. But if they were pushing a certain, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, intervention, um, had it themselves supposedly and smiling on camera, well, yeah. you know, God bless them if they do eventually wake up, but they should not be leading any revolution. It's no. like, if you got it wrong on this big one, and also yeah. if they stay within the visitant, and they weren't, aren't willing to go out. And I, I get that some people might feel that they're going to be ridiculed if um, they talk about the fake moon landings. But anyone that's really paying attention at this point will have looked at this and formed an opinion. Anyone yeah. that says, oh, I've never looked at that, is like, well, you aren't paying attention hard enough to lead us. No. You're not thought lead. No, that's that's true. You know, thinking about the seven thing, you know, the the, the the quality of the crisis actors that sometimes are wheeled out, particularly for that one that happened in London, the seven... Some of, and also the Manchester Arena. Some of the crisis acting yeah. there was terrible. terrible. Yeah, yeah, and and done probably at different times. I mean, I hope Richard Hall does uh, uh, very well with uh, the difficulties that he has ahead. Because I know we're going to cut off. I just want to get one more bit about the programming and how it goes in. You've obviously heard of Pavlov uh, and his dogs salivating to the bell. Just yeah, think of the school room. Think of the school rooms that you're in. How responsive the children were to bells or Walk, don't run. That is a strong conditioning process that is yeah. laid deep. Leo, I'm, I'm making a big guess here. I'm, I'm, I'm getting here, guessing here that you basically just gave the middle finger to all of that BS because I did. Always. And I, as a teacher, I would take, I would take the uh, Mickey out of it. I had zero tolerance for all of that. I just like Nazism, isn't it? Basically, training little training young people to be kind of obedient rule followers who'll do anything to appease the next layer up in the hierarchy. And it's, it's so immoral. Yeah. Unfortunately, parents thinking they're doing the best and not having put their own work in actually, and the child trusts the parents. So the parent says, you have to do this, go along with this, be a good boy, Johnny, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Leo, this is. Again. Say again, Leo. This has flown by again. Yeah, I know it has. We'll do we'll do another one. But God bless you, mate, and thanks so much for your time. Uh, really, really appreciate it. And it is it's a fan, it's a fantastic chat. This is um, you know even if I wasn't going to put this up on YouTube, I, it's it's you know it's it's been a fantastic interaction. I've really enjoyed speaking to you again, Leo. So thanks yeah, thanks I'll again. It's going to cut off in a sec, but God bless, mate. God bless, brother. Yeah. Cheers, then.